Just before the fall semester started, they gathered up the people that were to be in student government at the university, as well as people that were to be resident assistants, and they took us off to a camp to do some training. And as part of that training, they broke us up into three groups, A, B, and C, and they took us on a walk down a gravel path into the woods. And as we got down toward the end of that path, there was a big pavilion. And in one corner of the pavilion was a table with some resources on it, like construction paper and popsicle sticks. Down in the other corner was a one picnic table, and the rest of the floor was empty. Now our facilitator explained to us there on the path that we would be building a community, physically building a place for people out of all of the resources that we could purchase from this table. And then he stood there and said, all right, we need to spread out. And he looked into the pavilion and kind of went, group A, why don't you sit at the table? <coughs> hmm. Group B, why don't you take this space on the floor here in the, uh, up here at this side of the pavilion? And group C, maybe you guys can sit right here on the path because we need to be spread out. And so as he got done, there was a group of people at the table a group of people also in the shade of the pavilion there on uh, the floor, and then a group of people out on the path. As Jesus comes to this uh, dinner he's been invited to with the leader of the Pharisees, you can imagine that there were other leaders there, and he sees them all jockeying for position at the table. They're all trying to get place of honor, get close to the action of that place of honor at this table. And he has two things that he says to them. First, he tells them to humble themselves and to usually take the lower seat so your host can invite you up further. Otherwise, you might be, he doesn't use this word, but I want to use the word deflated. If you uh, think of yourself as taking up space, and if you think of that place as honor as a big space, if you take too big of a space than you are really intended to have, you have to be deflated down to a smaller space down at the other end of the table. And Jesus sees these people who are probably powerful people, used to having authority, having social power in the community, wanting to take up their big space. And he says, no, you want to humble yourself and be smaller and take up less space. He then tells them another little message that goes directly to the host, but he's speaking to all of them and says, listen, you all are fighting for these places at the table and trying to get the best seat that's closest to the action. But there are people that aren't even at the table, poor people, blind people, who are on the floor in the pavilion, or maybe they're out on the gravel path. They're not even included in this meal. That's who you ought to be inviting to these dinners, not the people that can invite you and bring you back to their place to repay you for what they've done. It's an interesting message that Jesus has about tables. And if you think about tables, tables are all over in our lives, and they really do. A lot of important stuff happens at tables. If it's our family table, it's where we process our days when we gather over dinner. It's where we learn how to talk probably when we're little. It's where we hear the stories of our families and the traditions. And when we gather beyond just our family tables, but at larger tables around meals, it's places where we meet. And sometimes it's places where there's influence and, and community sharing that happens. That's the meal that Jesus gets invited to. The leaders are gathered and no doubt processing what's going on all around them. But all tables are not tables for meals. There are tables that we gather around to negotiate. There are tables that our legislatures gather around to make laws. There are tables that we gather around to meet new people or to be in opposition with other people in legal proceedings. There are all kinds of tables that we gather around. And whenever we gather around them, there is something happening. And often that something that is happening is important. Now we can talk about having a seat at the table, and most of those tables that we gather around have a limited number of seats. So when we think about those tables that have a limited space, we sometimes have to elbow our way in, right? There's not enough space around the table, so if you want your voice to be heard, you have to get a seat at the table, we say. But there's not always a seat at the table. I would guess that most of you have experienced at one time in your life a time where there was no room for you at the table. It might have been middle school, when you walked into the school cafeteria and were trying to figure out where you fit in. I may have shared this before, but at confirmation camp this summer, we asked these middle school kids to draw their school cafeterias. 
And we asked them for, we said, we don't normally ask you to put labels on people, but just for this one time, we would like you to do that. And as they drew their cafeterias, they drew tables and they put names on them. And I walked around and looked, and there were some differences. Some of them had uh, a table called Goth for the kids that were Goth kids, and some of them had a table that said Ghetto. Some of them had a table, most of them had a table that said Popular Kids. Some of them had a table that said Semi-Popular Kids. All of them had a table that said Annoying Kids. And I asked them, how do the Annoying Kids know to sit at the Annoying Kid table? And you know what they said? Oh, they know. <laughs> as, if, as if annoying is a fact, not an opinion about how someone interacts with you. But none of them put themselves at the popular table. They were all mostly in the semi-popular table, which is a recognition on their part that there are tables that they don't belong at, that there is no space for them, and that there are also tables that they don't even want to sit at, and hopefully there's a there's social risk that you don't want to get too close to that table and end up being uh, one of those annoying kids. And know that there are people walking around that cafeteria trying to figure out where they fit in, and there is no table for them. But as we go through life, the, all those tables that are there, sometimes it's that family table and there's someone who's not welcome from the family. Maybe they've exempted themselves from that table. But when you're not at that family table, you miss out on the stories. You miss out on the care and the love that happens in those seats around that table. If you don't have a seat at the table where the negotiating is happening, whether that negotiating is a negotiation of household duties or it's a negotiation of union rules or it's a negotiation of uh, business stuff, whatever that happens, if you're not at the table, you don't have a voice. When you think about legislative tables, if you're in a position, if you're people who are like you, who have your mindset, aren't around the table, you don't have a voice. And so all of these important things, uh, places where important things happen, if you're not around the table, you don't get to have a say. And so as we think about what it is that Jesus calls us to, he seems to be saying, you know, there's plenty of space that you can take up, but you ought to get smaller so that people can have a space around the table. You ought to humble yourselves and make space at the table for other people. There's a woman named Amy Cuddy who wrote a book called Presence after she did a TED Talk. And her research is, uh, much of it is about how our physical posture affects our emotions and our behavior. And she has studied this to where if you uh, are going into what she calls like a socially stressful or socially risky situation, which would be a job interview, a presentation, uh, meeting uh, your loved one's family for the first time, those are all socially stressful. If you're going into that, you want to bring your best self. And she has studied this and found that if you uh, spend the time ahead of that, all like curled up in a closed posture in a small space, you, your body chemistry changes, your hormones change to the point that you are in a place of feeling small, so you don't bring your best self. So what she suggests doing is uh, if you're going into one of those situations, go sneak into like the stall in the bathroom and stay in like Wonder Woman for a little while, and it really physically changes your hormones in your body and you have a better likelihood of bringing your best self. Now all this sounds kind of a little bit silly maybe that just standing like this actually could make that much of a difference. But part of what she encountered in her studies is that people feel often uh, what she calls the imposter syndrome. And the imposter syndrome is the idea that you don't feel like you deserve uh, to have what you have or that you have fooled everybody to get to the point that you are. And so for, she has an example of a woman who has like a PhD in some kind of science. And the whole time she's like, well, I've fooled them this far. If they really knew, they would know I don't belong here. I never should have gotten into the school I went to. I never should have gotten the job I got. As soon as they figure it out, they're going to get rid of it. And what she found in her journey was that there are so many people that feel this way, feel like a fraud in what they do. People will find out that I'm actually a terrible parent. People will find out that I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. I went to a pastor's conference once and with a group of people uh, that were much younger than I, and I listened to them, and when I found out they were all making it up as they went along, I didn't feel so bad. Because this is the thing, right? You can feel like maybe people will discover that I'm not very good at this job, and then they'll say, why is he here? And so this imposter syndrome, she finds, is much more widespread than we might think it is. So as I thought about that in this text with Jesus, she would tell us to get big and take up as much space as possible and fake it not until you make it, but fake it until you are it. 
So if you don't feel like you belong, and if you don't feel like you really are worthy of all these things, and if you don't feel like you're your best self, just pretend like you are. Take up more space, have more sort of personal power, and then it will happen. You will become more personally powerful, meaning that you will be your best self more often. And as I thought about all that, then I have Jesus over here saying, no, 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 you need to take up less space, right? Don't get bigger, get smaller. And so I thought, well, which one of these things is true then? How do I stay small and be humble, but at the same time bring my best self, which I think God wants us to do, by being bigger? And then I thought about Jesus. These two things are not mutually exclusive. There is a personal power in being your best self, but that is different than the social power that we might carry with us. If you look at these Pharisees, they have social power, but they may not always bring their best selves. And if you look at what Jesus does, he comes into the world with an enormous amount of power, divine power. He can still storms. He can make people be healed miraculously. And yet when he goes to the cross, he takes all of that divine power and he gets small. He gets small on that cross and suffers torture and death and abuse and goes through all of that so that he can be big with life on the other side of it. He has to get, he's big, so he has to get small out of that power so that he can get big again in life for us. And I think that's the pattern that he gives us today, that we ought to get big, not in our own sense of being powerful for our own sake, but get big in God's grace, get big in God's love, trusting that we are indeed uh, beloved children of God, so that we can then, in that trust, get small to make space for other people at the table. I want to switch gears a little bit from the idea of tables and, and just talk about how it is we try to get close to the action. If you're going to a baseball game, where do you want to sit? Front row? Where front row? Behind on plate, right? Uh, you can't always afford to sit there. Sometimes the popular kids get those seats and you have to sit the semi-popular seats. If you're going to a basketball game, where do you want to sit? Center court. Put all the way up to the top? No, close down. If you're going to a concert, where do you want to sit? Near the front. Uh, if you're going to live theater or play, where do you want to sit? Right center, up close to the front. If you're going to an elementary school for a kid's program and you want to take pictures, where do you go? Front row. Where do you sit when you go to church? <laughs> you guys are messing it up a little bit. But um, often, what are the most popular seats in the church? In the back. In the back, right? So we always want to get close to the action until we come into this place. And then we keep ourselves distant. And I think somewhere buried in there is a deep truth that we somehow don't feel that we deserve to be up here. That we somehow are imposters in God's kingdom and that we don't really deserve God's love. And so if we're going to go out into the world and carry with that love with us and get big in God's love and grace so that we can get small to make space for other people at the table, it's important that we understand that this table we gather at really is for all of us and that we are all beloved children of God. And it might mean that we should just all sit up front close to the action so we can start to believe that. Pretend that it's true until it feels like it's true so that we can live in that grace and love. I want to go back to that pavilion uh, that day because I think it speaks to what it means for us to get small in the world today. As we started that activity, I was sitting out on the gravel and we were going about our planning and we had a, a designated representative that would walk into the uh, table and buy the things that we would then use to build our city. He came back and said, we don't have enough money to buy anything. Well, we could look in and see at the, the picnic table. They had already like construction paper buildings. We heard them talking about building an airport. They had all kinds of stuff going up. We could look over on the floor. They didn't have quite as much stuff, but they had plenty of things they were building. And we had nothing, so we said, well, we have gravel. We're sitting out here roasting in the sun on the gravel pack. Why don't we build some stuff on the ground? So we started to do that. And then there were police, and the police came over, and they said, do you have a permit for what you're building? And we said no, so they kicked it over. And then they asked us, um, so then we sent our guy to go get a permit, and we couldn't afford a permit. At that point, I got mad and started yelling. And I'm um, saying, this is, I, I, was, I think I was using the words persecution, persecution unjust, unfair, and what do you suppose they did with me? They put me in jail. 
And jail was at the other corner of the pavilion opposite the airport uh, and all the stuff that was getting built around the table. And so two people stood there, and the whole time I stood there, I just screamed and yelled uh, that this was unjust and that we were being wrongly persecuted. So when this was all done, they sat us down in our groups, and they started with the group at the table and said, what did you all think of this? And they said, we don't understand why he was yelling. Why would, and they were serious. Why didn't you just do what we were asked to do? Why did you have to stir stuff up and be an agitator when all we were asked to do was build some things? We did fine. They did fine. Why do you have to be such a pain as we go through this process? They asked the group B, they said, what did you think? And they said, well, pretty much the same thing. Like, we could tell they were doing really good. And we thought maybe we just weren't quite as good at it, but we didn't understand why this group had to be so obstinate about this process. And then it came to us, and they said, well, what did you guys think? And we said, well, clearly we didn't have the resources that they had. And we kind of went through this whole conversation about um, how it was that we felt. Now, what none of us knew, but they told us later, was that the group around the table, aside from being able to sit comfortably in the shade, had a whole lot more money in this play money world to do what they were doing. And the other group had less, but way more than we had. And it was an exercise that they uh, shared with us was for the purpose for us to understand what it feels like a bit to be discriminated against, <coughs> to have uh, an unfair playing field that you're trying to live life by. And what I took away from it was that there's a table, and when you don't have a seat at the table, it's a tough place to be because you don't have a voice and you don't have that power. Now, if you think about how that plays itself out in our lives today, uh, we're sneaking up in a few years on 100 years since women could vote. So before that, if you went into the legislature of, a, of our nation, what did you see? What kind of men? Old white men, right? So who had a voice at the table? Old white men. Whose perspective did they represent? Old white men, right? And so women had to come and start elbowing their way in and say, wait a minute, we would like to have a place at the table. And what did that mean for some of the old white men around the table? They got lowered down to a different seat, didn't they? Did that mean the perspective of old, man, old white men went away? <coughs> no, because there were still plenty of them around the table. But when I hear Jesus saying that you will be moved to a lower place, sometimes that means it looks like you lose your space at the table. Some people do. And then it made me feel stressful, and I'm sure there were people that said it was going to be the apocalypse, and you can't let women in here, and all this stuff's going to happen, and it's going to be out of control. But that's what happens, right? So now we live in today, where uh, we're sneaking up on 100 years of women having a place at the table. Are there enough places at the table for women? No. And now we have all sorts of other things happening in our culture, and people will stand up and say, hey, things are happening in our community, and Black Lives Matter. And the quick response is, all lives matter. Well, certainly all lives matter to God, but the, the statement Black Lives Matter is a statement coming from the gravel, shouting into the pavilion and saying, there are not enough seats at the table and we would like to have a seat. When you talk about immigrants that come into our country and we talk about the ways we interact with people and talk about immigration, it's all about having a seat at the table. And if there are not enough seats at the table, it may mean that old white men lose a few seats at the table but does that mean that old white men's perspectives are gone? No, because there's still a lot of old white men sitting at the table. And so when you think about all of the chaos that it feels like we're living in right now, there's a group of people that feel like their seats are being taken away and feel this tension and this strain that their uh, way of living and that their way of being is being challenged. But it's being challenged because there are people standing out on the gravel saying, it sure would be nice to get out of the sun at least onto the floor of the pavilion, but preferably all the way to having a seat at the table. So as we hear this word from Jesus today, I think what Jesus is calling on us to do is to get big in God's grace, to get big and understand that we are beloved children of God, and that is what defines us. Because I think what happens in the world is when we don't believe that, we then have to go out and fight for seats. If we don't believe that God has us, then we have to fight for ourselves. And if we have to fight for ourselves, we will make sure we get a seat at that table. But if we understand that God has us and God loves us, and it's not so important that we have to fight for ourselves, and then in that bigness, grace, and love, we can get small and make space for others to have some space around the table so that they can have life and have some of the good things that we have as we go along. And all of that bigness that we have comes from this table. It comes from this table, which has 
always plenty of room around it. That's why when we gather, we invite everyone to this place so that we can get big in that grace so that we can then go get small in our humility of God's love so that others can have life. As we go out from this place, it will be challenging. Getting small is a hard thing to do when it seems like there aren't enough seats at the table. But we know there are because God's table is big, it is endless, and it is full of grace and mercy for us to share with everyone as we go. Amen.